Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to introduce Andrea Murphy. She's the education specialist at the uh, Eisenhower Library in Abilene, Kansas. I should say that it's, you know, I live in Kansas, so I just assume everything is in Kansas, right? So <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to Andrea, and she's going to talk to you about uh, Dwight Eisenhower and McCarthy, and the title is The Consequences of Unfettered Power. So welcome, Andrea, and good morning, and thank you for joining us. All right. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, firstly, let me say that everyone calls me Joy. The only person who ever calls me Andrea is my mom when I'm in trouble. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so thank you for that. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Before I get started, I do want to acknowledge one of my colleagues who is not on here with us, Jim Ginther. He was actually supposed to present with me, but he's had a death in his family. Uh, so unfortunately, he isn't able to be here, but he was very instrumental in pulling together this program. He is our chief archivist. Uh, so without him, the documents that you see, I would not have. So I do want to recognize and thank him for all of his help. All right, so jumping right into this, um, I do want to uh, start off by saying why I chose the word unfettered. So unfettered means unrestrained or uninhibited. Um, I chose that, re that word rather than unlimited or omnipotent because when, we talking, when we're talking about Joseph McCarthy, he did not have unlimited power. What, what really took place is that the people who had the power to step up and say something made the choice not to. So it was unrestrained power. Uh, so that is, um, I thought that was a very important distinction to make. And so that is why uh, myself and Jim chose the word unfettered. All right, so we need to talk about McCarthyism, what it is, um, who Joseph McCarthy was, and then uh, get into um, sort of this idea of not speaking out. All right, so Joseph McCarthy was a senator, was a little known junior senator from Wisconsin. In February of 1950, he claimed to possess a list of 205 card carrying communists employed in the US Department of State. Once he made the claim, Senator McCarthy became a tireless crusader against communism in the early 1950s, a period that has been commonly referred to as the Red Scare. As chairman of the Senate Permanent Investigation Committee, Subcommittee, Senator McCarthy conducted hearings on communist subversion in America and investigated alleged communist infiltration of the armed forces. Subsequently, he was exi exiled from politics, which coincided with the conversion of his name into a modern English noun known as McCarthyism um, or an adjective that uh, McCarthy tactics when describing similar witch hunts in recent American history. Uh, the American uh, Heritage Dictionary gives the definition of McCarthyism as the political practice of publicizing accusations of disloyalty or, or subversion with insufficient regard to evidence and and the use of methods of investigation and accusation regarded as unfair in order to suppress opposition. Uh, Senator McCarthy was censured by the US Senate in De on December 2nd, 1954 and died on May 2nd, 1957. So that's a little background. So we cannot dig into McCarthy and McCarthyism without talking a little bit about communism and I'm not gonna spend too much time on it. Um, so I have the definition of communism up there for you to read, but in general, communism is a form of socialism. Uh, for the people who advocate for it, they consider it this very high and advanced form of social of um, socialism. All right, continuing on. Um, so before we get into McCarthyism, I thought it was important that we also hit on the responsibilities program. Um, and this is a program uh, from the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover is running this program. So Hoover's responsibility program often gets overlooked in the shadow of McCarthyism, but it was perhaps worse than farther reaching and longer, it lasted longer than McCarthyism. 
All right, so J. Edgar Hoover had been conducting surveillance of American citizens since the 1930s in order to find communists. This surveillance was illegal. He cast a much wider net when it came to what was called subversive behavior or subversives. He also targeted labor unions, civil rights organizations, colleges and academics, and anyone who he considered politically left could be a target. So the Responsibilities Program actually gave information to McCarthy and the House Committee on Un-American Activities. So, you know, who, who, uh, Hoover had started this in like the 1930s. So, you know, this idea of sussing out communists didn't start with McCarthy. Oh. So, so I want to dig into Eisenhower's initial initial response. So, you know, his first response uh, to McCarthy once he became president was sort of kind of a, a response of inaction. Um, so, or at least publicly, it looked like inaction. Um, now, behind the scenes, he was doing some other things. He was. Um, you know, he was doing a little political maneuvering, but it wasn't a lot, just a little nudge, nudge here, like, hey, let me go talk to this senator, this Republican senator, and, you know, say, hey, can you get your boy? Because he's talking out of turn, you know, just, but nothing major, no real overtures, no real, let me get this guy together. Now I'm going to hope this link works. I tested it. It should work. Yay. Can y'all see that? Yes. Shake your head. Oh. Yep, we can see it. Okay, thank you. All right, so, um, so this letter is a letter from President Eisenhower to his brother Milton Eisenhower. I thought it was important to show his words when it came to his thoughts about uh, 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 Senator McCarthy, and, and all of these documents are actually a, a part of our archive, so um, <laughs> they are available for viewing. Um, but his words, he says, and I'm just going to read kind of the first paragraph, and it says, as for McCarthy, only a short-sighted or completely inexperienced individual would urge the use of the office of the presidency to give an opponent the publicity he so avidly desires. Time and time again, without apology or evasion, I and many members of this administration have stood for the right of the individual for free expression of convictions even though those convictions might be unpopular and for uncensored use of our libraries, except as dictated by common decency. I won't read the rest of it, but just those words were enough to kind of understand where Eisenhower, President Eisenhower felt about, you know, confronting um, McCarthy. All right. So not everyone thought that President Eisenhower was right for taking, you know, this this kind of silent public silence against McCarthy or for not not speaking out against McCarthy. Um, there were people in his administration who felt a little differently, and not necessarily though because they didn't like what McCarthy was doing. Um, oftentimes, as we know, some things are just politically motivated, um, and so some of their reasoning was about politics. So I, I thought it was interesting, but this is a memo to Murray Snyder, who was President Eisenhower's press secretary. And this is uh, put together by two of uh, Eisenhower's special assistants. And it's a memo about, you know, how, they, how why, when, if they should respond to McCarthy. Um, so this is, you know, December, 1953. And so I thought it was interesting to see that, um, you know, they, they have these three main points for, for consideration and it's, you know, hey, McCarthy has attacked the president. So, you know, at this point, McCarthy is saying the president is weak on communism, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that is threatening, you know, how the president looks to the people and also to the country, to the, to the world. Um, but then they're also concerned, you know, somewhat as, as President Eisenhower is, like if he comments though, does that give McCarthy the platform he's looking for? You know, is that gonna give him, is that gonna add fuel to his fire? Um, and then they're also looking at, um, you know, will 
will President Eisenhower speaking out against McCarthy jeopardize his own plans for the country, right? Because President Eisenhower is a Republican president. Um, McCarthy is a Republican senator. And at the time, the, the Republicans in the Senate had not yet felt the need to speak out against McCarthy. And so, you know, pre they were concerned if they took this, you know, if they, they took this stance and spoke out against them that then the Republican senators would no longer support Eisenhower's agenda. Um, so I'm going to slide down a little bit to something I thought was funny. There, there are all kinds of reasons in here about why, why they should speak out, why they shouldn't speak out. Um, part of it was that because, uh, you know, Eisenhower though was, was considered a very moderate Republican and so many non-Republicans had voted for him. And they were like, this is a great way to, you know, solidify that base. They voted, they didn't vote for Republicans, they voted for Eisenhower. So they're already thinking about in his first year in office, they're already thinking about getting him reelected. But um, D is important, or it's, it's, it's interesting to me because, you know, they're like, this is one of the most dramatic moments in the president's career. You know, again, he's only, you know, in his first year in office, but, you know, they're talking about, you know, he could really do something with this and he can really, you know, make himself look like this amazing leader if he speaks out. So, okay, so moving on. So we're at our first discussion question. Um, if anyone would like to unmute and answer this question, you know, what happens when we do nothing? And by nothing, I mean, when we see something going on that we, we know might not be right. In this case, like, you know, um, Eisenhower knowing that what McCarthy is doing as far as, you know, kind of throwing people's names out there with no real evidence is, is not right. Um, <clears throat> what happens when we do nothing or what can happen? Anyone wants to chime in? And I don't see, I guess I can get on the chat. Yeah, there's some answers in the chat. Okay, sorry about that. Implies support. Imply support. The January 6th insurrection. That's, complicit. yes, a modern take on it, yes. <laughs> you are complicit. Yeah, encourages more of the same activities. Exactly. So all of that can happen, right? When people make the choice not to do, not to do anything, um, not to speak out. All right. Okay. So back on here. There we go. All right. So I wanted to roll this into the consequences of apathy, right? So, you know, when we're talking about apathy, we're talking about lack of interest, enthusiasm, or concern. So you know, Eisenhower not speaking out initially kind of looks like, you know, he has, he, he has very little concern. Now, depending on what side you are on, depends on what you mean by little concern, right? There are some people who thought he had very little concern about what McCarthy was doing and what he might, you know, how that might jeopardize people's civil rights or whatever. But there were also people who were saying that he was unconcerned about the spread of communism. So um, I wanted to talk about, you know, what kind of what apathy looks like. <clears throat> and so part of that is to want to, I want to discuss why a, a more in depth, why Eisenhower didn't directly respond. So first, first things first, like I said earlier, he was kind of nudging some senators behind the scene, but he had hoped that the Senate would step up and would just censure him and be done with it. You know, that it wouldn't be something that he would have to take on. He didn't want to appear soft on communism. Now I'm going to say, change that a little bit and say, he didn't want to be, he didn't want to appear soft on subversion, right? Because, you know, I want to take a moment here um, so the, the, the word subversion is the act of undermining power and authority of an established system, system and institution. So part of McCarthy's, um, you know, his, his, I don't know if, if agenda is the right word, but it was always about 
you know, these communists were trying to overthrow the government. So if you were accused of being a communist, you could, you were automatically accused of trying to overthrow the government. So the problem with this, right, is that some people were communists, many people were communists, simply because they supported socialism and a socialistic government. They were uninterested in th overthrowing the government. They weren't selling secrets to, to the Russians. They just supported socialism. Um, you know, but but the big thing about this is that, you know, of course, this is this is the Cold War. This is what's happening here. And so this really isn't a fear of, of communism. This is a fear of the rise and spread of the influence and power of the Soviet Union. So um, communism is is connected or associated with the Soviet Union. So it become, become, becomes kind of this catch all for the sphere of of this this spread of of, of 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 the Soviet Union, you know, and their power and their influence. So he doesn't want to appear really soft on on subversion, not necessarily communism. Um, and then he sort of saw initially McCarthy as kind of a little fly, like a fly that was just kind of flying around and buzzing. And if he ignored it, he would even it would eventually go away, you know, like a little gnat. Um, just you know, I don't want to give it, him any, as we said before, a platform. I just want him to go away. And, and if, I, if I stay quiet on it, he will eventually. Now, I'm not really sure why he thought that, um, other because at this point, you know, again, it's 1953. McCarthy first, you know, gets this, this popularity in the 1950s. So that's during the Truman administration. And so, you know, three years later, he hasn't gone away. So I'm not sure why he thought that. Um, but that's kind of what he thought. All right, so I wanted to talk about why it was interesting that Eisenhower took this initial stance of, of um, not responding when he himself had seen firsthand as General Eisenhower, what happens when people are apathetic to the things that are going on around them. Um, you know, he, he was a five-star general, he led, you know, in, in troops in, during World War II. So he absolutely saw <clears throat> what happened. So, you know, speaking to, of World War II, you know, many Germans were indifferent to the, the mistreatment of Jews due to ongoing racism and stereotypes. And this is, this is leading up to World War II. Um, and then they take a policy of, you know, it's happening to them over there. It's not happening to me. And that policy of, of apathy, of it doesn't concern me, that's them over there. You know, this is kind of what leads to this rise of the Nazi power party. This is kind of how this allowed this, you know, the 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 thoughts and the policies and the 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 ideas of the Nazi party are allowed to fester and grow. Um, and then you get kind of this idea of fear too. And so and citizens buying into these ideas of, of a master race or or whatever and so then you start getting citizens who who support it on some level and so now they're turning in other citizens they're turning in their neighbors they're accusing you know when we're talking about the red scare we're talking about people falsely accusing their neighbors um or hearing the word communist and saying, oh, my neighbor's trying to overthrow the government, you know, during World War II, you have people saying, oh, I know there's some Jews living down the street. I'm going to turn them in. Or I know there's some Jews hiding in this house. I'm going to turn them in. You know, there's a case of where, you know, there was a nurse, I think, I believe she was a nurse who was trying to, who was saying she was going to help Jews. And in fact, she was finding out their locations and turning them in. So, you know, it, it, it surprised, it's, it's surprising to me that Eisenhower sort of took this, this apathetic um, stance for, uh, uh, with McCarthy because he had already seen firsthand what that could be. And he had seen the tragedy of it because you know, the final solution you know, estimated you know, approximately 18 million deaths from genocide. So you can see what happens, right? And then, 
<coughs> we get, um, you know, we get the, the, the Rosenbergs here in America, you know, as an example of people who were falsely, who, who were accused, I can't say falsely or not falsely, but who were accused of being communists um, with very, and convicted and sentenced to death with very little evidence very little evidence and, and who were basically presumed guilty just by the accusation. Um, so anyway, um, but the, the, and last but not least, the consequences of apathy leads to, you know, violations of human and civil rights, things that we as Americans tend to hold dear, right? So, you know, some of the things that are, ha that happens during the Red Scare, um, did I skip something? Oh, sorry. We get um, we get illegal spying by the FBI. We get attacks on freedom of speech, and you know, in America, we 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 hold freedom of speech very dear to us. Someone takes that away from us, we feel like that is wholly un-American. But that's what's happening here. You can't even speak out about the the type of government or in support of a different type of government without being falsely convicted or falsely accused or being accused, um, losing your job, you know, possibly just having your reputation ruined in some sort of way. Um, there's an assumption of guilt. There's, there are convictions with very little evidence. Um, but I will say that eventually we get Yates, Yates versus the United States government. Um, and this is a decision by the Supreme Court that says that you must prove that an individual took concrete steps to try to overthrow the government. Um, and that's a good thing. Um, so uh, we get to our next discussion question. And it says, what happens when the person or people who have the power to act choose not to? So I'm going to bring up the chat again to see if there are any comments. So somebody said 18 million, yes. So those are some of the estimates and we're talking about the whole thing. Some of the estimates are up to 18 million. So we get corruption happens during that time period subversive appears to be happening in the more recent, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read this. Had a large percent of Americans I don't know. I'm having issues here seeing these. Okay. Yeah, I don't know what's happening. It looks like we have corruption happens. They become explicit bystand. Oh, implicit bystanders. It okay. So, yes. A vacuum for other opinions. Right, and and, and you know we start taking this this idea these. <laughs> the things that we hold dear to us, our rights, you know, we start seeing that some of these rights might, you know, we might not have them anymore, you know. Um, someone said inaction is action. And that's, that is very true. It is very true. Um, not acting is still, an, is still an action. All right. Okay, so um, I do want to discuss what I call the trickle down effect. And no, we're not talking about economics. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about like what is happening on the federal level and how it kind of trickles down to state and local governments. So <laughs> we start to see um, kind of some similar programs in different states, even states that now we would consider uh, fairly liberal, and even maybe back then would probably have been considered fair, fairly liberal. Um, you start seeing kind of these these similar programs or similar laws. Um, so, you know, in California, we get the California Senate Fact Finding Subcommittee on Un-American Activities, and that is a mouthful. Um, in Florida, we get the Florida Legislative Investigation Committee. Now, I am from Florida. So I'm gonna, I know a little bit more about this. I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more. More importantly, I'm from Panama City, Florida. And the state Senator who was over the Legislative Investigation Committee was from and, and represented Panama City. So this is something I know a little bit more about. Um, but like the Florida Legislative Investigation Committee was created 
as a way to suss out communists and subver su subversives. Um, at least initially, that's what it was supposed to do. And they go after college professors, and in particular, they go after Black professors um, because the NAACP uh, tends to be, you know, was was being labeled as this communist um, organization, and um, Black professors tended to be uh, members of the NAACP. So, you know, they they absolutely went after professors at um, Florida A&M University, uh, but that's what they were going after. Uh, but eventually they are really unable to prove anyone's a communist. So in order to continue their committee and to continue to get funding for the committee, they decide to cast a wider net. And now they are going after, they decide to focus on homosexuals and homosexuality. And so we get this, this image that you see that is called the purple pamphlet. Um, now, you can see it's, it's not produced till 1964, um, but the committee itself, it forms, I believe in 1956, um, <laughs> as they do this uh, investigation. So this investigation eventually, you know, they, they, they conduct hundreds of interviews and it eventually leads to um, lots of professors losing, have, being forced to resign, particularly at the University of Florida. Um, some of whom may have been homosexuals, but many of whom were not, um, but they were just accused of, of being so. Um, and so they lose their jobs. But what's very interesting about this is that this purple pamphlet, you know, they were so proud of their work and they thought this was going to, um, you know, kind of elevate them and make them, um, you know, get all this public support and the public actually didn't support it. Not because they were, they were anti-homosexual or they were, you know, they were pro-homosexuality, but because this book was actually really graphic. So there were all these pictures in here of like naked men. And, you know, that part of it was, um, you know, they, they were basically saying that, you know, if you were homosexual, you were, um, you were also a pedophile and, um, you were trying to recruit young boys to become homosexual, all, the, all those normal stereotypes that you hear. Um, but there were pictures like naked men in there of uh, in sexual positions. And so people were outraged that their tax dollars were used to create what they thought, what they said was basically pornography. So because of the outrage, the committee was dissolved. And that was the end of that. Um, on some level. But all across the country, you start seeing laws on criminal anarchy and criminal syndicalism. Um, so, and then you start seeing very severe punishment for being a communist. So death penalty, um, essentially that was the most severe you could get, but lots, there were several states who, um, who passed laws that you, you would receive the death penalty if you were found to be a communist, right? And then of course, some people passed local laws as well. You know, you couldn't be a teacher, you couldn't be, you know, whatever. You couldn't live in certain places, just all kinds of laws. All right, and there were a couple other, um, other kind of programs that weren't really, um, I, I don't know if I wanna call them laws, but, but some places started requiring people to sign loyalty oaths to the constitution. Um, in Hollywood, you know, blacklist came out um, for celebrities who were considered, who, who were thought to be communists. And then of course we get the Lavender Scare, which happens during like what we call the, the second Red Scare. Um, but, you know, that created, you know, this panic and about homosexuality again. And then, you know, this mass dis dismissal of people who were thought to be homosexual from government service. All right, so um, I'm actually wrapping this up for questions, but before I do that, I thought it was really important to show public thoughts and opinions on, um, on everything that was going on, McCarthyism, Eisenhower's response and things like that. So we, I pulled a few letters. I'm not gonna go through all of them or I didn't do it, Jim did it. So um, kudos to Jim, but um, a couple of, of letters that we have. So this one is from, um, Miss Ed, Edward Conway, I think her name is. 
um, from Tampa, and I'm only going to just read the first paragraph, and it says, Dear Mr. President, it is with regret that I feel it necessary to write this letter of criticism. I wish to draw your attention, draw to your attention that I am tired of this persecution of Senator McCarthy. Um, it is a sad thing to have to say this, but he is showing in the face of violent opposition more courage than you in, in fighting against communism. You are afraid to acknowledge that you can and do make mistakes. He is not only fighting communism, but also some of his fellow senators eggs on by communist propaganda. Take for instance, Drew Pearson, who has no concern for the welfare of his country, only to get revenge on Senator McCarthy. His column and TV broadcast breathe, breathe hatred in almost every line. He purposely twists everything he can, thinking to turn it to his Turn it to his advantage. Why is he out here? Why is out there using his God-given talents for personal hatred when he could be fighting communism for his country? Maybe he doesn't want to fight it. Um, and this letter, of course, comes out in you know August second of nineteen fifty four, and this is around the time where you know the Senate is getting ready to censure um, McCarthy. And then we have, I'm just going to show one other letter, and that's from um, Stephen Schiffers. And this is December of 1953. And it's to also to the president. And it says, Dear sir, people are getting more and more afraid to speak up against the Wisconsin senator and his methods of intimidation and guilt by association. Even the powerful radio and television station granted him free time, to which he had as much right as I. From your high office, you cannot fight in a like demagogic an undignified way, but I believe that you and your staff will find methods without being declared un-American to stop this presidential aspirant and other super Americans who have monopolized the right to determine who is a communist, who is a good American, and what our foreign policy should be. So across the country, it wasn't cut and dry about support for, for or against McCarthy and Eisenhower, but at the end of the day, you know, the, the conversation is, you know, should Eisenhower have spoken up from the beginning? Should Truman have spoken up? I can't speak for the Tru President Truman or the Truman Library. Don't know what documents they have. But, you know, again, you know, when, when McCarthy comes out with this list, Truman is president. So, you know, should Truman have spoken up? Um, did McCarthy or did Eisenhower you know, take the right steps that there are some places in there um, where he makes some roundabout comments, like he does a speech um, at some point, uh, kind of where he kind of admonishes McCarthy, but he doesn't say it outright. It's, it's more about freedom of speech and more about, you know, the things that we hold dear in this country. So um, discussion, when is the right time to speak up? Anyone wants to chime in? Well, and we can, you know what? We can take this on immediately. Yes. Joy, can I say something? Sure. Yeah, one person did speak up pretty early. Uh, Margaret Smith, Ch Margaret Chase Smith, a woman senator from Maine. Mm -hmm. That was 1950, but I, I don't know if she got a whole lot of attention. And Truman said she did a good job, but she could have gone farther. But as you say, I don't know if Truman said much. I, you know, she said it pretty early too. You know? Yes, um, yes, and, and and I'm sorry. By no means do I want to say absolutely nobody was speaking up. I'm not going to say that. Um, what I'm saying is, you know, President Eisenhower in particular, um, but but also maybe Truman. You know, sometimes some things kind of need to be a top down kind of kind of solution and maybe if they had spoken up from the beginning and I don't know if this is the answer but if they had spoken up from the beginning you know could you know the things that happened to people various citizens because of Mark McCarthyism could that have have not happened you know would he have been would he would he have just gone away if they had immediately spoken up and said hey this isn't okay yet people did not speak up because of fear Who expects white men not to disappoint? Okay, I can't speak to that. People were afraid that they would become a target. 
so I'm actually finished. Um, so we can talk, we can uh, talk about how to make this relevant to your students. Um, we can just talk about the discussion questions more. I'm here to answer questions and comments. I'm going to come out of this so that I can see, stop sharing so that I can see your comments and questions better. Okay. So any info on the other Senator Wisconsin at the time, did he push the issue target McCarthy? You know, I don't know the answer to that. I don't actually know who the other Senator um, from Wisconsin was at the time. Um, that's probably a, a good question. You know, was he, um, maybe I can find him and find his papers and maybe he was in the background speaking out and saying, hey, you're wrong. Um, but I, I don't know the answer to that. Fierce relevance of political divisions and social problems that exist today. Yes, so, <clears throat> you know, when we're, um, you know, when, when you're out here talking to your students and trying to trying to make this relevant, one of the reasons I, we chose this topic is because I, when I was a, briefly a teacher and taught American history, I felt like McCarthyism got like this much information and then it just got passed over, um, you know, as part of a bigger discussion on the Cold War. But I think it's something that, you know, when we're talking about civil rights and when we're talking about um, human rights, you know, it's an important conversation to have because it's something that easily can and, and does happen over and over and over again. Um, so having those conversations, I think is important and being able to make it um, relevant to, to what's going on in the world today. So someone, I saw a question about the purple pamphlet. Okay, so the purple pamphlet um, I guess it was a part of the larger Lavender Scare. Um, it, let's see, 1964. So the Lavender Scare is part of the second Red Red Scare. So yeah, I would I would agree as far as a you know in large and whole. Um, I don't know that it was a direct like oh they're doing it up here we can do it here, um, or it could have been hey we see them doing this in Florida we're going to do this on a bigger scale. I'm not sure which came first. Um, Maybe they were working together. I don't have any evidence of that, um, but absolutely it could it could be. I mean, there was certainly, you know, a point in American history where you know that conversation kind of turned, and it was like, who else can we attack? So, um, so he was a Republican. I forget his name. A pamphlet against McCarthy extolled him as a good example of political civility. It. It extolled McCarthy as a good example of political civility because that's funny to me because he absolutely was kind of just. No, no, no. He extolled the other guy. It was it was a pamphlet about a lot of ALCU type people were on McCarthy's case and they had to picture this guy it might have been Lacey. And they said, okay. this is a good example. They said the other guy was a good example, not McCarthy. Okay. Okay, that makes more sense. <laughs> it's like that's that's a little odd to me because McCarthy is a little, he's a little out there. But can I just say one more thing? Sure. Yeah, you know, I'm not, I, I, I despise McCarthy, but he did have his supporters at the time. And, you know, with the Korean War going on, I think that did extol people's fear. He absolutely like, had, yeah. had supporters. Yeah. Kind of yes, like absolutely. today's red, red states have their supporters. I regret to say, you know, they're 50% of the country or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, I know. He absolutely had his supporters. Um, what, what's always interesting, what's, what's most interesting to me about it is that, you know, as I've said already, as American people, we, we tend to hold our, our civil rights very near and dear to us, you know, the things that are guaranteed to us by the Constitution. And, it, and you know, it doesn't matter or shouldn't matter politically, whatever side of, of the political divide you're on, you know, it shouldn't matter that you're on, that this, you're on this political divide when it comes to civil rights. You know, or you're on this side of politics when it comes to civil rights. Um, you would think that in general, we would be like, you know, let's uphold the constitution, let's uphold our civil rights. But, you know, there were so many people who were just like, this is fine, or this is not just fine, but yes, keep doing this. This is what you, you're supposed to do. 
and even though they are very clearly seeing and, and you know i'm talking about in the in the government in the you know senators all the way down to the average citizen very much seeing that these are violations of people's civil rights and and basic human rights uh, let's see what is interesting is that now the pendulum has swung to target those Americans who feel strongly about their rights. Right. And about their patriotism, learned a ton about this working on my criminal justice master's degree. degree. So I don't know if um I don't know if I can if, if I can properly respond or answer that um, it's not really a question but I just feel like in general you know however you feel about whatever is going on in this country basic civil rights should be considered and I think you know as as teachers you know whether you're teaching American history or whether you're teaching teaching civics. Those are these are the kind of conversations you you should be having with your students about like like how do we protect civil rights? You know, is it ever okay for something to be going on in this country that allows people's civil rights to be taken from them? You know, or you know, having those conversations. Anybody? Questions, comments? I'm trying to keep up in the chat, but I'm not really. Can can somebody help me out? Uh, that might be true. I mean, civil rights to me is just, you know, these are the things guaranteed to me about the constitution within the constitution. That's pretty much how I define civil rights. Yeah. I spend um, a lot of time in my class looking at the difference between like civil rights and civil liberties, mm -hmm. as well as um, looking at the incorporation portion of the 14th Amendment. So students really can understand in theory how their rights evolve from like protection from the federal government to protection from a state government and some of that stuff. Um, I work in the urban core, so we spend a lot of time on the Bill of Rights. Okay. And I mean, do you, are you able to have those conversations um, um, about like McCarthyism or about, you know, anything? Because you could have a bigger conversation, right, about the Cold War because yeah. the Cold War created so much fear. You know, are you able to have those conversations and, and how does your, how do your students respond? Uh, actually, over summer school, since it was only 20 days, I only did the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And that meant that we spent a couple of days on McCarthyism and things like that. And I had 10th and 11th graders in there. And I felt like they handled it very well, mainly because we had already been discussing um, perception and ideas and that kind of stuff, starting with the Cold War. So they were able to kind of step outside of it and go, okay. I may not understand it right now, or it doesn't apply to me like I think it does, but they could step back and understand where some of the fear was coming from. And also like, we looked at a lot of cartoons about overreaction and things like that. And we actually had a lot of really good discussions about it. Okay. Um, someone does ask about Eisenhower's response to the McCarthy army trial. So um, specifically, I will, and I don't know if this is exactly what you're talking about, but at one point, McCarthy attacks um, General Marshall, and um, Eisenhower doesn't, doesn't speak out, in my opinion, like he should in defense of Marshall. Um, he does eventually give a speech, and I think I, I, I kind of referenced it a little earlier, um, where he is sort of kind of defending Marshall. He, he well, I won't say sort of kind of. He is defending Marshall, but in a very roundabout way, very general way. Um, so I would say that, um, again, he never really, really like put any meat to him speaking out, uh, to speaking out against McCarthy, even, and, and some of the people in his own cabinet really had issues with his handling of McCarthy, and some of that was the attack on the on the military, um, the attack on Marshall. So, um, I don't know if that answers your question. If not, let me know. 
10th and 11th graders are very thoughtful and reflective. Good. That That's what I want to hear. I want to know that the, I, I really want to know that, that these kids are being able to make those, um, those connections, those those modern day connections, and really get an understanding about what happened, and really, um, even in outside of the classroom in their own lives, you know what can happen when you see something is not right and you don't speak up. All right, I mean, I, I still have a little time. If you don't have any other questions, then I guess I'm finished. These and have I, been I very, very good questions. Attention. Thank you, Joy. You're welcome. Anybody, any, uh, any last questions? Sometimes people are typing longer questions, so I always pause <laughs> for a longer, for a longer typed question. Here's your opportunity to type in. Oh, uh, somebody mm -hmm. looked up the other senator for you. Okay, thank you. I don't. Is, was he a Republican senator as well? I'm. I'm. I, I don't keep up with senators like that. I will tell anybody I'm a historian, but I'm not a research historian. Okay. Oh, so I don't know if he spoke up, or or so you said someone said that. Um, uh, I think they said ACLU or someone had put out saying that he was a a, a better senator. Um, I don't know. Better better might be relative. <laughs> they, they, they mentioned him as a responsible senator as a good example. They didn't say too much about him. That I recall. It's been 30 years since I read it. But. And he was a Republican, right? As far as yes, I remember. He was. Yeah. Thank you for that. More on foreign policy. Yeah. Somebody mentioned a Truman, asked about Truman early. I think, um, I don't want to get too far into weeds on this, but generally, Truman, for a lot of the time as this was going on, was being accused of being soft on communism. And so we tended not to oppose it, even though we didn't like Senator McCarthy at all. In fact, we've got some unpublished letters. Truman had this thing of writing missives and then putting them in his desk drawer and not sending them. It was his way of venting. I should try it, actually. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, he did that a lot. And we've got some of those in our archives because he kept them. Um, and so he didn't like McCarthy, but the point was he was being accused of being soft on communism, so he didn't really speak up. And he also took actions that seem really out of place now, like the loyalty oath program for federal workers, which was then expanded later, um, but, it, um, but it set a bad precedent. And we actually have a large display about that. Um, in our new museum, we don't shirk that issue in the museum. We actually have a loyalty oath game that you can play within the museum. And then Daniel comments his uns unsent letter to McCarthy is a great source to use. Yeah, I agree, because it really kind of, and he do, it's not just him that he does that with, but we have a number of examples of that. So his attitude was he, he was being accused of being soft on communism. So if he stepped, you know, if he went out of line, um, you know, then he would be accused even more so. Just to wrap that up, though, on the 48 election, you know, Henry Wallace runs against him because he thought he was being um, too mean towards the Soviet Union. So he ends up having a, 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 an opponent in the election on the Progressive Party who really wanted him to be friendlier towards the Soviet Union. So he couldn't win either way, right? So that was yeah. kind of, that's kind of interesting in 48. Yeah, I think in general, um, it was a lose-lose situation no matter what would happen. And for both Truman and Eisenhower, if they, if they spoke out, um, because there was this, this accusation of your, your soft on communism, you know? Um, we've got some great Googlers and, and researchers <laughs> today. Somebody just posted the link to Doc's Teach with that letter that I was referring to. And then there's a very, very long comment. So maybe Joy and I can both read it at the same time. <laughs> well, I do want to right. say that, you know, many of the documents that I, I've shown you are on our website already, but I will send like the letters and things like that on to um, Teresa for her to send out. Um, but also if you use our finding aids and you see something, but you can't find the document online, send me an email. 
I'll, I'll talk to our archives team and see if we can find the document for you.